Hi, I'm Steve Jones from Redgate Software and SQL Server Central, and I want to continue with our series on SQL Change Automation and show you how you can use it in a team environment. Now, if you watched our last video from Kendra, you'll notice she created a new SQL Change Automation project. Uh, she added in the Northwind database, and then she made a change, and she pushed all that to version control. Now I could certainly say a new project and uh, do this. I could certainly call Kendra and ask her for the code, but I want to show you how we can use Azure DevOps to make this much easier. Now, if I look on my system, I actually don't have a Northwind database that I can use for development right now. Right? And if I look in my code area, my source repos folder, I don't have a Northwind project either. So I want to get Kendra's code down to my system. So if I go up to Azure DevOps, dev.azure.com, I can go to the RG Demos organization, which uh, I can do because I'm a member of this organization. Kendra made me a member. Uh, you'd have to create your own organization. Now I have my Steve Jones Redgate org and then the RG Demos. And in RG Demos, you can see I have the Northwind project that Kendra created. So let's go into that project and look around. Now the overview shows you the description she added for the about. Uh, you can see that Kendra and I are both members. And if I go to the repos, what we'll actually find is all of the code that she created in her project and put or submitted up into version control. And she committed this in the master branch and we can see everything here. I want to copy that down to my system. Now, certainly I could download it as a zip, but I want to be linked to this actual project. But before I do that, I want to work in a branch. I don't actually want to mess up Kendra's work. So I'm going to work in a branch so that all of my changes can be uh, made on their own, and then we can submit them to review. Kendra can then pull them into her branch and merge them if want, if need be, or uh, she can abandon them and get rid of them. Now you notice it created that branch very quickly. It just made an exact copy of all that code. Let's get it down to my machine. Over here in the upper right hand corner, there's a clone button. Now I'll click that. Now I could clone this in various IDEs, but I'm actually going to show you how to do this with old style Git. So I'm going to copy this URL. And then what I'm going to do is pop open a command line and I'm going to say git clone and I'm going to pull down a branch from this repository. And when I hit enter, you can see very quickly this pulls down 71 objects. And if I go look at my repos, you can see I have the Northwind folder with all of the solution files inside of there. So let's get to work. I can come back to Visual Studio and I can go look at that repos folder and open up the Northwind solution. And when I do so, what will happen is the Solution Explorer will load up the entire solution. I can see uh, Kendra's baseline script and then her change. I have the pre-deployment script. I have the programmable objects. Everything that I need in here is loaded up into the solution. This is on my local machine. Now, when I come to the SQL Change Automation pane, you'll notice that it says pending scripts found. So it's found a number of scripts that haven't been deployed, deployed to my database. Uh, the connection for my database is down here in the lower left-hand corner. And you can see it's set for local DB Northwind. Uh, by default, we go in local DB to allow you to work and then Northwind database. I could certainly change that to a, a normal instance of SQL Server or change the database name, whatever I want to do. But I'm going to leave that alone and I'm going to click deploy project. And when that happens, Visual Studio is going to execute a build. And this build will include going through the project and executing the various files. So when it generates this script to run, what it's actually going to do is start with the pre-deployment script right here, which will create the database, uh, we'll add some extended properties, and then what it'll start doing is executing uh, this first migration script that we see, the baseline script, which is this 001 script. And if you can see that it prints out a number of information. So the first thing is customer demographics. If I actually open Kendra's baseline script, you'll see that's the first thing that's output from the file. There's a print statement that outputs this. And then the next one is the primary key, and then customer, customer demo, and then that primary key, and et cetera, et cetera. And if we scroll through the build log, we'll actually find that second migration script. So if I open that script, this is creating the index IXD you see me. And if we go in the output, we'll see that down here that migrations from folder 1.1, the IXD you see me was executed. And this is how we can track what's going on. And then the programmable objects execute last, and then we can see the build succeeded. Uh, the post deployment script also executes. Now, if I go to my local instance and I now refresh this, 
what I'll find is that the Northwind database exists and all of those tables and other objects are here. SQL Change Automation has applied these migration scripts and the various programmable object scripts to give me a development database where I can do some work. So let's do some work. Let's come up here and let's create a new table. Now this opens the standard database project table designer where I have a, uh, a GUI view, some metadata, and then the code view at the bottom. I actually want to cut and paste code in because I like working in code not so much in the designer. Now you can see that the designer does update itself. We get the keys up here, uh, or the columns, and we get the key over here. Everything looks good, so let's update. Now you'll notice I have two options here, generate script or update the database. I can do either one of those. They both work fine. I tend to like generating the script before I change the database, but that's just me. When I do that, what happens is a second migration script is added to the latest folder, the 1.1 folder. And you can see it's got uh, 002 and then a timestamp in my name here. And I could change this if I'd like, and I often would change that to say uh, what this is kind of doing to give me just a subtle hint. But in here, you'll notice I get a new migration ID, which is a unique GUID. I get my print statement for the build output, and then I get my code. Up here at the top, it says I have a script pending deployment. And if I look over here on the right, there are two options. I can mark this as deployed or deploy the project. If this code has already been run, you know, if I had actually clicked something to execute this code in my database in Management Studio or in Visual Studio or VS Code or anywhere else, uh, I could just click mark as deployed. Since I didn't do that, I'm actually going to pick this Deploy Projects button. Now when I do that, it's going to do another build. In this case, what it will only execute is just that migration script that I created because the other two migration scripts have already been running in this database. I can close this now because I no longer need it. And I can certainly close my migration script. And now when I come over here and look at my database, you'll see the status lookup table exists. One thing I didn't show you here is that typically we will have a shadow database and that is used to verify the scripts. In SQL Change Automation, we often see this refresh button in our little SQL Change Automation pane. When I click that, it validates all of the scripts that we have against our shadow database. In this case, because one didn't exist, it actually creates it. So if I now come up here and refresh my list of databases, we'll see that I have a shadow database and the table is there. So I've made a couple changes. They're down here in the pencil item. Let's go ahead and push them forward to uh, get them back to Kendra. So let's say added new table to track status. Status, we'll spell that correctly. And now I'm gonna commit and push this out to the Azure DevOps system. If I come back to Azure DevOps here uh, and I actually refresh things, what we'll see is that my migration script is actually been added. You can see it's listed here, and if I click on it, we'll see that code that we saw in Visual Studio. Now this was made in my Steve branch, but we wanna now let Kendra see this. And so you'll notice that Azure DevOps gives me this little hint, says that you updated this branch, would you like to create a pull request? Now, there are times where I may commit multiple things. I commit something that I'm working on, but I know that the work isn't done, and I'll do something else and make a second commit. So this isn't something I always do as a matter of fact, but in this case, these are all the changes I'm gonna make, so I will click this create a pull request. When I do that, this is essentially a code review item that just notifies everybody in the project or specific people that we need to look at some code. So when we do this, it says there's a new pull request that's gonna take code from Steve and put it into master. That's fine. By default, this takes my commit message, but let's go ahead and change this. Um, look up table added. I'm just gonna make this generic. I've got my description here. I could certainly add specific users, like if I search for Kendra, I'll find her identity in here, and I could pick her as a reviewer or pick somebody else on my team. But in general, I like to leave this open to everybody. Uh, and this search is really, there it is. Uh, I can see her identity here, but we'll just go ahead and leave that blank so that anybody on the team, including new people, could actually review this code. And then, I could add work items, and then I can double check what's being committed. So the three changes from my project are here. Here's my migration script, here's the schema model file, and then the actual SQL project files there. So let's click, click create, and then we've got a new pull request. 
And you can see that I could add a comment myself if I needed to. There's the description. Uh, the files are here, they're all listed. And it's now in my list of pull requests. Now it's up to Kendra to view that code and decide if she wants to add it to her project. Stay tuned for our next video and we'll see what she does.